So let me go um, go through this really, really quickly because I really want to kind of get to some questions as well. So I'll talk a little bit. I talked a little bit about why we formed. Obviously, we have interest in changing this. It's about high quality schools. Um, it's not that we don't have enough schools. We have plenty of schools at this point. We need high quality schools. And of the 200 plus schools that services our children now, only about 31 have shown consistent progress. That doesn't mean they're they knocking it out the park. We only have a few very high performing schools. Most of them are DPS schools. But only 31 are showing consistent progress and showing that students are growing, not necessarily matriculating successfully to the next grade, but they are actually gr showing growth from grade to grade. Um, so we think that this is a good moment for us in the sense that um, we've just emerged from bankruptcy. I think we all live that, that nightmare. Um, and so we're at this inflection point where we have to figure out um, how do we um, make sure that as much as we have emerged from bankruptcy, that we also emerge from this education nightmare that parents live every day? Uh, one of the things that I tell people, if you look at New York and New Jersey and some of the other big cities, Chicago, when they were faced with some of the same dynamics that we have in, in, in different contexts, but very similar, one of the things that they did was educated their way out of that situation. So education became an economic development strategy. It's not just because it's morally the right thing to do. But if companies cannot find an educated populace to um, be employees in their companies, they're not coming. And if um, families cannot find a good education system in which to invest their young people, they're not coming. And so we have this dynamic that in this moment that we can capitalize on to help us do what other major cities do. And that is prioritize the education of our children. And so we should have a say. So one of the things that uh, we get faced with is this whole notion um, that the state has literally run um, the public schools for the last 15 years plus. And so, um, you know, knowing that simultaneous to us actually developing our coalition, we had gotten word that there was this progressive plan that may have been underway of some sort. I've never seen it. Um, but evidence by the fact that Paul Pasterick, who was an avid um, advocate for uh, what New Orleans looks like right now in terms of how they pretty much chartered pretty much all of their schools, um, that we knew that that was an indication that there may be something similar on the horizon. And that's just suspecting that that could be. Um, but I'll give you a similar example. So when we talk about bankruptcy and Governor Snyder brought in um, Kevin Orr, and he was one of the best bankruptcy lawyers in the country. Um, let that be a clue that, you know, and that, I think at that time the communication was we're not, that, we're not considering right. bankruptcy or that might not be the priority. Um, let it be a clue when you get the best bankruptcy attorney, that's what's up. So right. um, hence we went through that situation. And so when we see Paul Pastorick in my head, I say, well, what is he here doing? Because we haven't had a tsunami. Now we got some issues, but we're not, we're not New Orleans. However, when you begin to have folks like that come around, the question is, are we going to continue to allow our children to be put upon, which no other community would do, or are we going to collectively um, put our separate interests aside and will our leverage and influence to put forward what we believe is the best for our kids? And so we chose the latter. Um, so just in terms of how we're structured, there are um, 36 of us now, I think, serving on uh, the steering committee. And so we meet every Thursday. It's a very long day for me because my meetings usually start at 7 o'clock and I usually get home about 8. Um, and wouldn't have it any other way. Our coalition meeting is usually 2 to 7. Um, but we also have, so this is about 36, 38 people. Uh, but we also have um, a number of subcommittees. And so we have six subcommittees. Uh, one of them is looking specifically at finance issues. One of the questions, and I'll talk a little bit about them, is how do we resolve the DPS debt? If we're going to move forward, we can't seriously continue to operate the way we actually have. And so we have a finance committee. They're also looking at other costs of special ed and all these other kinds of things that really become a drain on the ticket. Um, and so looking at issues of is it adequately funded, is it not? Um, you know, what are the barriers there? Uh, we also have a committee that's focused on governance, it's a very, very hot issue in this community, um, given um, some of the democracy fights that we've actually had and how fitting uh, that we're in the NAACC NAACP building. I remember when they had the fight around affirmative action. Um, and unfortunately, I think, I know I was involved in that and a number of other folks, 
was to me a sad moment in Michigan. And so um, um, I bring that up to say that to me, this fight is just that important, just as important as that. Um, so we have these six committees. Uh, one of them is the Parent and Community Voice Committee. Um, that's the committee that I co-chair with three other folks, um, Jimmy Settles from the UAW, uh, David Carroll from uh, uh, Dan Gilbert's guy at Quicken Loans, and um, Poncella Hardaway. She's done a lot of work with Moses in the church and the faith community. And so uh, we've been aggressively working to make sure we create lots of ways for people to give input into this process um, as a believer of doing things with people, not just for folks, that's important uh, for us. We also have a special needs committee, understanding that our children, um, as you talked about the kids count earlier, um, I don't have to read the study to tell you that our children are well below uh, poverty. Uh, I think we have about 60% of our children in the city of Detroit that live well below the poverty line. And so um, with that comes a number of different issues. And so we've had conversations around how poverty actually impacts children uh, being educated. Um, the fact that our teachers a lot of times have to do so many other things to even ready them to learn by the time they get to the classroom. And so those are some of the discussions that we have. And then we also have an academics committee, and all of them are equally important to me. I'm very proud that our academics committee, um, really all of the people who serve on that committee are teachers. They are educators. Um, I heard somebody say that you've been an educator for 46 years. You know, they are 49, you said? I don't want to take a year away from you, brother, because the Lord didn't call me to do that, <laughs> uh, to be in, in the classroom. Um, it's a heavy lift, but all of the folks um, who are represented in that group are educators, they're principals, they have worked across systems and currently uh, represent all different types of interests, but primarily represent the profession of teaching and what that means. And so who best to tell us how that should go uh, than the teachers themselves. So that's a little bit about how we're structured. In those um, subcommittees, uh, we have an additional, I think I have probably 22 folks who work with me and trying to define what the problems are, and for us is specifically how do we better integrate parent and community voice um, and share decisions across these systems and so that you're not just giving input. I don't want you to hear me, I wanna vote. And so that, that's the kind of uh, discussions that we've had out in the community around how this should work. We have um, five co-chairs. We're a good looking group too. Um, and so we have Tanya, you guys know Tanya. None of these people are strangers. Um, David Hecker uh, from AFT, John Recoulter from Walbridge, and also uh, Angie Reyes, who is um, part of Hispanic Development Corporation in Southwest Detroit. And so um, for the most part, they are um, you know, just supporting us through this whole process. And um, this will kind of give you a broader sense of some of the other folks who are involved. You'll probably see some folks who are members of the NAACP and uh, people who have done work in and around this community for a number of years. And so, you know, I just think we have some of the best minds, not all of them. I run into people every day saying, oh my God, we should have had you involved. We should have had you involved. The reality is that um, we got a lot of good people involved. And at the end of the day, we're going to all need to be involved. And so that's part of why it's important that we have these conversations because um, it's important to be on the same page. And we operate uh, under this notion that there's about 70% of things that we literally probably all agree with. Uh, there's 20% um, that we don't agree with at all. And there's 10% that we'll probably, um, that we'll figure out how to live with in some form or fashion. But uh, we decided that we're gonna focus on the 70% of the stuff that we can all figure out and agree with. So that gives you a sense of some of the other folks who are involved. Um, these are the committees. I kind of talked a little bit about them. We have the policy committee as well. And I cheated a little bit because these are a core of the folks who are actually involved um, in part of the New Detroit board. And so as we have these broad discussions, looking at um, New Detroit's board is a place where you have a lot of corporations in which they're trying to understand what are the education issues and what are the implications for you know their companies and how they can get involved in supporting. Um, one of the things, and one of the questions that we asked in the community had everything to do with you know how should community broadly defined business being included in that be involved with the education system. So the charge and the timeline, there's six questions that we're actually um, working to answer. 
One of them is how do we resolve the DPS debt so the district can survive because the reality is every year demographers have been actually right. They've lost about 10,000 students. Um, and so it doesn't matter if you uh, make it this year, if next year your deficit will just continue to grow if you're continuing to lose um, students. So there's all kinds of things that they're looking at and considering. Again, I don't believe what you read in the paper because we haven't set forth one recommendation, but there's lots of conversation. Part of how we do our work is we kind of have looked at some of the best practices here in Detroit. We've looked at some of the best practices and talked to experts across the country and we bring them in. In my committee, I start with parents because they ultimately are the end users of the systems that we're trying to correct parents as well as young people. Um, the next question is how do we rationalize and coordinate systems so that all children have access to a good school that's not okay um, if I have a good school in my neighborhood, but uh, because the school may do a lottery, if you will, and I wasn't chosen that I don't, I get ostracized from that excellent education opportunity. How do we level the playing field in that way? Uh, what common or support services are needed? We know that our children, when we look at 60% of them living under the poverty line, we know they're coming with some issues. We know they need additional support, and yet we continue to let them just go into systems and expect them to do everything. And so we need, somebody mentioned triage earlier. We need some, we need some triage around that, but that's intentional, that we look at how do we intentionally build community supports in schools where we know um, that that uh, school community needs it and that it relieves teachers of having to focus on that so they can focus on doing what they do best and that is teach our kids. Um, the other is what's the future state of DPS? You know, how do you best position it to be successful? Um, what's the future state of the EAA? Um, there's been a lots of discussion around uh, the fact and, and the governor will also say um, I was one of the first appointed board members, um, believing that um, in the situation where we took the lowest performing schools who had failed for decades, not just the two and a half, three years we've been talking about with the EAA, that insanity is the definition of doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get a different result. Uh, well, this has not produced that different result. They're restructuring themselves in a way um, that looks like it can be promising. However, we're not going to hang our hats on one thing. Um, and so how do, what's the future state of the AA and then what's the future state of charters? When you look at most charter boards and um, they could service upwards of 900 to thousands of children and yet when you look at the board that actually governs the school, there's not one parent or community member since, um, sitting there. That's not okay unless they're handpicked. And so what does that have to look like in order for us to have a system that is best, that, that asks the question, is this good for our children first? Um, so we've asked um, the mayor and the governor to hold off on making any decisions. They both agreed. Uh, we had a very long conversation uh, with our mayor and who has said, you know, if you want me to help, I will. If you don't, that's fine. Um, you know, and this, the same thing with the governor, to hold off. And so we actually have to the end of this month, so I got to go. <laughs> Just, I got to go. We have work to do. Um, but it will address those six core questions. And so... Uh, from that point, we will begin to negotiate and think about how do we move this agenda. Um, this is not the first time a plan has been set forth like this. I, in that same office where I told Reverend he looked like 50 Cent, um, he pulled out a plan that he had done as part of the Grand Home Administration, saying we had gotten a, a similar group of folks together. And we haul us different things going on, and you know it's a pretty solid plan. You know, um, some pretty good recommendations came out of that, and I think that you know it kind of got sidetracked by the politics of the day. You know, nobody wanted to be spoon-fed some. It came off the backs when we had just organized as a community to get the right to vote to have a school board back, and then we let anybody run. And so as a community, we can't just hand this over and let anybody handle it. And I think that is one of the challenges that we've had in Detroit. We fought for it, but then there's some folks, when you talk about a multi-billion dollar industry, you just can't let anybody run that and so we've had some good folks and we had more challenging people on that board i think that's it okay. yep okay. so with that um i want to just open it up